This is why you always check your inner cover or the lid for your queen. Every now and then she'll be up there. So time got away from me yesterday and I didn't get cells dropped in newts when I needed to. So I'm having queens emerge on my kitchen table this morning. And I'll show you what I've got here. I've got test two bracks from Amazon. Those are pretty cheap. I've got these double-ended hair roller cages. A cell drops right in them. And if you have timing conflicts, it makes it pretty handy because these plugs go in here and I can put a candy plug in there or just direct release them after I introduce. So having them emerge into these just keeps them from killing each other until I can do something with them. Pretty handy. Hey guys, Nathan Duck River Honey. This is number eight in my uh, vlog on building a bee business. I'm trying to scale this year and get to where I'm sustainably a full-time beekeeper. So it's been an eventful week. Um, <laughs> Saturday morning, fr last Friday evening, we had a, a bad, a severe thunderstorm come through. There were tornadoes in other states. Luckily we didn't get that but a front rolled through and i thought it was a tornado uh, i heard stuff crashing outside i got out of bed and was going upstairs to get the kids and take them down to the basement but i turned the tv on and saw that it was just a severe thunderstorm with straight line winds it was not a, a tornado so i didn't get the kids up i did stay up and you know check things out uh it flipped the western side of our smokehouse roof over to the eastern side of the smokehouse there's a you know we live in an old farmhouse and it um the old part of the house i think was built in 1900 so smokehouse probably dates to sometime around there it's a log building that's been added on to and it took the the western roof and rolled it over the entire building and dropped it in the yard on the eastern side and that same wind hit the western side of a line of six beehives and dominoed them. Um, I, I've got those facing due north because I, I need to have them facing due north. I prefer to have them facing south, but I had to have them facing north. And um, man, I, five out of the six went down. So got up Saturday morning knowing that we'd had that wind. I went and checked all my yards and I found that, so that was a rough way to begin the weekend. Got them fixed up as good as I could. Um, had to get nukes pulled, so I had nukes up on, on top of hives. I had queens uh, that I got into the incubator on Saturday, and they were going to emerge Sunday to Monday. Supposed to emerge on Monday. And I was trying to get all of my nukes pulled. 
I was going to finish up Sunday after church. Didn't get that done because my syrup tank or my syrup pump wouldn't prime. And I messed around with that for two or three hours trying to get that figured out. Took the pump apart. I thought it had a, a clog in it or something and just couldn't get it to work. I ended up filling feeders with a square bucket. In fact, this square bucket. Um, if you have to pour syrup, these square buckets work really well because you can pour out of the corner. Um, and with these mother load in hive feeders I've got, it actually works really good to do this. I know I'm kind of squirreling here, but with this big opening, you can pour out of a square bucket straight into this and it, it goes fast and it works good. Um, so in a pinch, uh, that's a good way to distribute quite a bit of syrup. So I didn't get my nukes finished until Sunday evening late and I was supposed to be dropping cells. You know, I was supposed to be getting my nukes done on Saturday and let them sit queenless overnight and then tear down emergency cells and go ahead and introduce queens. But I didn't get my queens introduced until Monday. So I had queens emerging in the incubator uh, Monday morning. So <laughs> made the most of it, let the kids watch that. And my wife saw it and you know, it's, it's neat. It's like new life. Uh, that's always pretty cool. Um, they're just fascinating little critters. So I had to do virgin introductions. I don't have queen candy made yet because I wasn't planning on needing any. So I had to do direct introductions. Um, I had to cage them and then go back after a couple of days and direct release them, uh, which means more trips. And my wax dip tank, I made a lot of progress on it. I've got a divider in the tank now. Um, a problem I was having is I built the tank so I can have two stacks of boxes or two stacks of equipment. My tank is actually large enough I can get bottom boards or migratory lids in it, um, two stacks. It's uh, 24 wide and by 36 long. I actually wish I'd made it 25 wide. Uh, I'm almost getting a little uh, uncomfortably narrow on that dimension, but it works. It works okay at, uh, at the dimension I've got it. So I got a divider put in because when I put in five mediums, you know, you stack three up and then put two inside or you do three deeps, two stacked up and one inside. The one that is inside will kick out and it'll interfere with the other stack. Uh, on the other side. So I welded up a divider to put in the middle of the tank so that if they start to kick out, it, it keeps them straight, divides the two sides, but it's not a, it's not a baffle. You know, the wax can mix between the two sides of the tank. It just keeps that wooden wear from interfering. And that worked well. I got a 18 gauge sheet metal lid made for the tank. I've been meaning to do that for a while. I had a metal shop in town, um, use their machinery to get it bent and everything. Then I finished welded it, which welding open corners on 18 gauge is, um, that's not in my skill set. I, I had to learn how to do that. <laughs> I'm not a sheet metal welder, but I, I figured it out. So that was, that was actually kind of fun getting all that stuff put together. I'm almost done with that system. I, um, I've got to add on to my, my drip table and I may build some sides to keep wax contained a little better and keep it from falling off and falling onto the bottom of the tank and stuff. But um, I'm almost done with that. Um, I fired up the other day and I think I did 100 bottom boards, 60 mediums, and 25 deeps, and then a couple other just pieces uh, all in about five hours. So that's not too bad. Um, the problem is that's five hours of work after six or eight hours of heating the tank up. So you've got to start early in the morning unless you dip for multiple days. If I heat the tank up on day one, then the next morning go and, and you know, fire the burners up, then it'll be hot within a couple of hours. But if I start it from cold, it takes six or seven hours typically. So a lot of lead time there and a lot of propane burnt. Um, what I'm going to do now is I know how much equipment that I have dipped and I took measurements on the level of wax in the tank when I got started so I can measure it now and figure out the volume of wax that I have depleted and then I'll take my tanks and get them filled, 
figure out how much propane I've burnt and get an idea of what my labor cost is going to be. And then I can kind of figure out what I'm going to charge to do this because I'm sort of surprised, but I've had a lot of people bringing me things to wax dip. Uh, I guess everybody hates painting as much as I do. And, you know, wax dipping, I think, is a better process, which is, um, I, I mean, I would pay for it if somebody locally had had, had a tank. So um, I'm surprised at how much interest there's been in that. I really am. I mentioned I had a problem getting my, my syrup pump to prime, so I reworked that. I was using a one inch PVC pickup tube, and uh, for whatever reason that wasn't wanting to prime. It had always worked before, but it didn't want to work that day when I needed it really bad to work. So I put a through wall bulkhead fitting in the bottom of a 55 gallon drum, and it extends into the drum far enough that I can screen it with eighth inch uh, mesh hardware cloth to keep bees or you know debris or anything from getting into the pump. And then on the outside, it's a, a three quarter MPT, so I just put a ball valve and a couple fittings that uh, change that over to GHT thread and hook a garden hose to that, and that'll be my intake for my pump. And since it's come feeding from the bottom of the tank, I've got head pressure that will make sure that my pump primes automatically as soon as I turn that ball valve on. Uh, I've experimented with that a lot so far, and it works every time. Uh, dry pump, wet pump, doesn't matter. It works every time, which is what I need it to do because when, I, when I'm going out to feed bees, I don't need to have problems and have to work on things. I just need to get my work done. Uh, that's very frustrating, very frustrating when I can't get my work done because stuff that should just work doesn't. So queen rearing went well. Um, I've actually grafted, I actually grafted in my first year of beekeeping. I just wanted to cross that off the list. I knew that that was going to be a core competency that I would move into at some point. And I'll get off track here for a second. I think about this as... Um, core competencies, let's put it in those terms. If you want to be economically sustainable in beekeeping, there are certain things you just have to do well. There's not that many things you have to do well, but the things that you do need to do well, you've got to be good at. Uh, keeping bees alive and healthy, queen management, um, you know, you've got to have these core competencies. Queen rearing, I think, is like a beekeeping superpower if you have the ability to produce your own very high quality, well-mated queens at will, um, man, that just opens up so many opportunities for you. You can sell those queens, you can breed queens and actually sell breeding stock, but you can also requeen all of your colonies every year if you want to. And you do it on your schedule, not some other queen producer's schedule. So. You know, if it's going to rain on Thursday and you don't want to introduce queens on Thursday, then you can change your schedule so that you don't have to. There's just a, a ton of things that you can do if you can make your own queens. So that is a competency that I feel like I've got to have. But not only that, I really enjoy it. So I think I'm going to get more into queen rearing than I expected to this year. I, I think of that sort of as like a perishable skill. You've, it takes practice to get good at it. And I want to practice it a lot this year so that I, I can get good at it. So coming up, um, work coming up, I'm going to try to get back in the honey house. I've got some electrical to finish up and then I need to start hanging wall paneling and ceiling paneling. Um, I, I need to put in some 240 volt outlets and I want to put in at least one outlet on the outside of the building, a weatherproof outlet on the outside of the building and then I'm going to start closing in the walls and the ceiling and um, I feel like I've gotten through my split you know my first split and hives are kind of on autopilot now you know I don't have any immediately swarm any immediate swarm concerns uh, at least for the next week or 10 days so if I can get a few days to go knock on you know knock out some of this workload I'd really like to get that project finished finished and get my permitting done and just have that checked off the list completely so that I can focus on 
the million other things I've got going on. So I wanted to talk about my mating yard, my nuke setup, and my drone flooding yards. I'll show you on a map. I've got three bee yards that are all about 1.3 miles apart. And then I set my mating yard up almost in the center of all those. Um, research has shown that drones will usually, everything with bees is usually, uh, because they, they will break their own rules all the time, but usually drones will fly a quarter mile to a half mile from their parent hive and virgin queens will fly generally a mile to a mile and a half from their parent hive before they try to mate. And they do that so that virgins don't mate with their own brothers. Uh, it's to prevent inbreeding. So by placing my mating yard inside a ring of out yards that have good strong colonies and a lot of drones i'm able to ensure that i'm getting well mated queens uh, queens that have ample drones to find and mate with you know bob benny did a video on polyandry that uh, keith delaplane at uga has proven basically that the more drones a queen mates with the better off the hive is it's a it's acts like a form of heterosis or hybrid vigor so the more drones she can find the better um, so i want to have a lot of drones available for these queens to mate with and then the the way that i'm setting my nukes up i'm an all medium beekeeper and one of the reasons why is my nukes um, so industry standard is probably a five frame deep uh, nuke box and five deep frames equates to about seven and a half medium frames so how i set my nuke boxes up is i just use a double frame feeder and eight medium frames and then say you want to make a, a three deep frame split well that's going to equate to a four and a half medium frame so I've been targeting about five, um, five drawn frames, at least one food frame, two or three brood frames, and frame of bees, maybe some resources, as many as three brood frames and a, you know, a food frame or two. Um, I did make up a couple of four frame splits, but most of them are fives because I want these hives to get strong enough, quick enough that I can use them to requeen or boost production colonies or possibly get them ready for the june to july honey flow you know we'll get sumac and some sourwood and it's usually not that great but some years it's pretty good um, so these hives may be ready for a honey flow at that time so since i'm using 10 frame mediums for my nuke boxes i've only got 10 frame footprints and 10 frame lids i don't have to worry about five frame equipment so i've just got uh, double screen boards that i use for a lot of different things. Uh, I can use them to put a nuke up on top of a big colony and share heat, but I also just use them as my nuke bottom boards. Uh, they've got a small entrance, so I don't have to worry about um, putting excluders in and, and pinching that entrance down so that the bees don't get robbed and all this. So in this setup, I've got a double screen on the bottom. I've got a nuke on the bottom. And then I've got a double screen on the top and another nuke on the top. The entrances are facing opposite directions. So one, uh, the top nuke is oriented this direction. The bottom nuke will come out the other side. Place these in the edge of a field and I've got bees coming out both sides. The advantages of doing it this way are that uh, I've got two chances at getting a mated queen at each hive location. So if I only get one mated queen back, I can pull the double screen and merge the two colonies and then move that colony out to an out yard and um, you know, I, I don't have to worry about it. So I've now got plans of setting up some queen mating nukes and um, I'm thinking I'm actually going to make some divided boxes, divided mediums, do five frames on each side in a single box and have an entrance facing each direction. So I'll have two colonies side by side in here and would probably use a migratory lid if I needed to feed them. I'd use a jar feeder or a bucket feeder on top of the lid, but uh, would try to just keep good honey frames in here so that I didn't have to feed them. 
And then that would be a, an easier package to handle because these doubles, uh, the stacked nukes, they get a little heavy, especially when you've got syrup in them and you're trying to move them or, or whatever. And when you go in and work that bottom box, you have to take the top box off and then all the bee, all the field bees are coming back to that top box and they're around you and uh, you know they just get to aggravating each other and things. So there are some downsides to having the stack nukes like that. Making, trying to make strong hives early is why I did that. But I think having some divided uh, queen mating nukes would make a lot of sense for me. So I'm gonna try to do this. The problem is I probably need to come in a quarter inch with a rabbit right in the center of this box. And then I've got a half inch handle in here. So <laughs> you got three quarter inch wood with a half inch hole in it and you cut a quarter inch in from the other side. Well, there's nothing left there. So I don't know what I'm gonna do about that. I may talk to my woodenware supplier and see if I can get some ends made with cleats or just no D, D cut handles on the, on the short pieces. And um, I'll have to figure that out. That's something I'll just have to figure out. So there's a quote by Edwin Markham that I really like. He was the, he's long dead, but he's, he was the poet laureate of Oregon. And it's a blacksmithing related quote. He says, for all your days prepare and meet them ever alike. When you are the anvil, bear. When you are the hammer, strike. And I like that because there are so many times in life where you feel like you're just being beat down. And then there are some times in life where you feel like you can do no wrong and everything's going right. And uh, no matter which, which one you're in, you should act the same. You should do the same things be the same person. Um, that's, that's the meaning I get from that. Well, early this week, I was feeling like the anvil. You know, I've had a, I've had a tough last year and quite a bit of adversity recently. And stuff was just everything tearing up, everything going wrong. And I was really wanting my path to get a little bit easier. You know, wondering why things have got to be this hard everything fighting me all the time and the next day i got a letter from charles arnold who is the owner of the dinner bell restaurant in berea kentucky and he's wanting to carry my honey and possibly sell it in his store and he's wanting to support me uh get, gave me this big long letter uh, just incredibly kind and generous and encouraging so Charles, if you're watching this, I really appreciate it. Guys, there are good people in this world. And I tell you, I get a lot of encouragement from uh, the comments and the support that you guys give me. It, it really does mean a lot. I, I, have trouble, I have trouble putting that to words. I, um, I don't know, I just, I have trouble expressing myself on things like that. It means a lot, it really does. So question and answer this week comes from my friend Dave Rowden. I met Dave at Hive Life and you know you just meet some people and you you know you're going to like them you know you're just sort of cut from the same cloth or on the same wavelength or whatever and uh, I feel like that about Dave he's a he's a really good guy He says I'm curious how the painted boxes do in the wax dip I'm rotating freshly painted boxes for older box older boxes during my hive inspections Still deciding on starting up a wax dipping operation for my small operation. Might not be worth the overhead. Um, as far as how the painted boxes do when you wax dip them, I wax dipped this painted box just to show you. Um, they do fine. Um, I think it's an improvement. And there is a little bit of extra wax coating on the outside of the paint that didn't come off like it you know on the unpainted boxes it will actually soak into the face grain so you don't really feel or see the wax coating on the outside on this box a little bit of wax is left on top of the paint 
but the corners have a good wax coating. The inside of the box got a good wax coating. I just don't know how much wax soaked into the face grain and the end grain because this is already sealed with paint. I don't know. But I'm heating these boxes up to about 235 to 240. So I've got to guess that some of that wax is getting into that end grain. And I do think it's going to make for a longer lived box. Um, it may not be as, as long lived as this one though. This one will be easier to re-dip down the road. So um, it looks fine. Um, another way to put this is I've got a bunch of drawn comb uh, honey supers stored in a barn and I am going to take my freshly wax dipped boxes and put all the drawn comb into these and get those empty painted supers and I'm going to dip them. Uh, before they go on hives so I'm gonna do that and I probably got 40 or 50 boxes over there I'll put them in with the next load I do have to get some more equipment assembled I've got 270 boxes here that I've got to put together so um, I'll get about a hundred of those put together and then with the painted ones I've got and the hundred that I've already done that should get me pretty well into the season without having any emergencies in equipment. So channel news, um, I've got a video on my hives falling over. It'll be pretty brief. Um, should be interesting though. That'll probably post tomorrow morning. That's the only thing I've got to post this weekend. I will be heading to Corey Stevens, I think on the 15th of April. And then I'm most, most likely going to head back to Corey Stevens in uh, June, I believe. And I believe if things work out, I'm going to have the opportunity to document uh, Kara Wagner's unhealthy brood odor spray that tests for hygienic behavior in bees. And uh, Corey's gonna be able to compare the results of that with the results of his Harbo assay looking for hygienic behavior in bees. That should be very interesting. I'm really, really interested in this UBO because it could, it's got the potential to revolutionize looking for hygienic behavior, testing for that and uh, uh, breeding for it. So I'm really excited about that. Guys, I'm also going to be doing a giveaway soon. So I'll, I'll do a video just on this, but I'll give you guys a, um, a teaser here. Um, we're going to do a best beekeeping joke competition. I've been wanting to do a giveaway for a while just to thank everybody. And I, I sort of think giveaways are cheesy. I don't, you know, I, I don't interact with those very much when other channels do them. But uh, something like this is so cheesy <laughs> that I think it's funny. So we're going to do a best beekeeping joke competition. Bob Benny sent me a smoker that he signed with uh, a paint pen uh, with color red. It's a queen marking pen for this year. That's going to be one of the prizes. I have requested some other things from some other well-known people and we'll see what we get to put together as a pool of prizes for this thing. Um, I'm probably going to have to have some of the guys at my B club help me with it because there are you know, there are things that everybody is good at and everybody is bad at. I've got strengths and weaknesses. Uh, one of my weaknesses is I, I couldn't carry a tune in a five gallon bucket. I sing in church, but I'm terrible at it. I also have no sense of comedic timing. I am not funny. I'm just not. And uh, so I'm not the person to tell jokes. So I've got to figure out how to do this so that we can tell jokes and then be funny, do them credit and have people around to judge and have a good time. So I've got to figure out how to do that. But if you've got some good beekeeping jokes, keep them to yourself for now and enter those in the competition. Guys, as always, I try to answer a question or two a week. If you've got one, drop it in the comments below. You can also send it to info at duckriverhoney.com. I'll get them. I'll try to pick out one or two and get them answered. Appreciate you watching. I'll see you on the next one. It's a mess in here. You can tell me it's beekeeping season. We've got stuff strewn everywhere. Everything's broken. 
you need to work on everything and nothing is where it should be. Yep, that's beekeeping season.